Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 856. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Ryan Danker, and it is May 15, 2024. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could be here. I have a guest, a special guest, Dr. Ryan Denker, who is my on-site expert of the Methodist Church. And uh, a lot of people have been sending me email, what are you going to cover this, what are, you know, on Unscripted. And I, I have a chance now, because Ryan's got some free time for an hour or two to sit down. It may take a week to talk about it. But maybe, uh, maybe. But we'll talk a little bit about what's happened in the uh, United Methodist Church, Methodist Church, Global Methodism over the last couple of years, and put some perspective to it. Talk about the history of it and what the future holds for global Anglicanism. First of all, welcome to the program, Ryan. How you doing? Well, thank you, Kevin. I'm I'm doing well. Glad, glad to be here. Okay. Now, people. You have seen you on the program before. You uh, are certainly an expert on Methodism, and you are the president of the John Wesley something something something. <laughs> I'm, no, the, I'm the director <laughs> of the John Wesley Institute. Okay, so you're yeah. the guy to talk to. I I, I hope so. <laughs> okay. Now, when all this was going on, a lot of uh, people I wanted to talk to in the Methodist Church said it's too soon to talk. There's a lot happening in the background. It's not safe to give out uh, a lot of opinions right now. Um, it was like when uh, George Floyd happened. I call all my uh, friends and say, hey, we need to do a show on that. It's too soon to talk. Let it play mm -hmm. out a little bit and see how it works. And so this has played out. We have a clear divide within Methodism over um, some changes to the uh, um Bylaws, you know, for better intent. Uh, you know, what, yes. what, what do you guys call them? The discipline. Disciplines, okay. Yeah. Of, yeah. of the Methodist Church. And you changed regards to marriage, living in celibacy, and uh, mm -hmm. who can get married, who can't get married. And yeah. let's lo talk about quickly, th there was obviously some foreknowledge that something big was going to happen this year, and there was a disaffiliation time period for churches to leave the United Methodist Church a year in the last year or two. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it was slightly different. The, the, the disaffiliation, well, it's funny, well, not funny, it's, it, it's a sad story, but in 2019, sure. there was a special general conference held, and for um, Anglican viewers, it, it's the equivalent of a general convention. Mm -hmm. um, 2019 special general conference was held to address once and for all the issue of sexuality. There were a number of plans put forward. Um, the one that, that won the day was called the traditionalist plan, which maintained the United Methodist church's historic, um, stance, uh, essentially affirming that marriage is between one man and one woman. Um, the, what happened though, after that, and well, in the midst of that, the conservatives actually thought, and they were trying to be kind, they put in uh, a paragraph that would have allowed progressives to leave the church if they couldn't agree to the traditionalist plan. Well, so they put that in there for the progressives. In the end, though, what happened was be because the, the progressives um, essentially run the episcopacy in the, in the UMC and the boards, of an age, boards and agencies and the seminaries, uh, the progressives simply said, we're, we're just not going to enforce this. We're not going to live by this. And so, you know, there were bishops who um, didn't conform their life to the discipline. There were clergy th around uh, the country who were, you know, opposed to the discipline. Anyway, so it, in, in effect, the conservatives took advantage of the disaffiliation process that they had created for the progressives. Um Knowing, not knowing that 2024 would mark, mark a, uh, a distinct departure for, for the UMC, but knowing that maintaining an evangelical presence in a structure that was dysfunctional was not a long-term project. Mm -hmm. And so, so 7,600 churches left over in the last two years. 
Well, you know, if I'm doing my math, that's a lot different than what happened with the Episcopal Church versus the ACNA in uh, 2008 and 9, where there right. was some 400. Uh, that is quite a catechism. Some people, including yourself, had said this is the, the greatest schism, you know, depending on your pronunciation, since the yeah. Civil War. Right. That's crazy. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's it's huge. And um, I mean, to give to give us an idea of how large it is, there are six thousand parishes today in the Episcopal Church total. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about something uh, a break that the break alone was larger than the Episcopal Church. Sure. So um, a, a massive shift in the American Protestant landscape. So some seven thousand churches have chosen to leave and disaffiliate. Mm -hmm. 7,700 some. That's quite a bit. Uh, what does this make the Methodist Church look like? Because um, there's just like the Episcopal Church, uh, the Episcopal Church wants to be global. It's not. The Anglican Communion is the global entity that represents the Episcopal Church. Uh, Methodism is a little bit different. I explain right. how that works a little bit. Yeah, and, and of course, we're talking about United Methodism in particular. Right. Um, there are all kinds of forms of Methodism, so it's uh, we just have to be careful with that one. Okay. Anyway, um, well, you know, you got the AME and the AME Zion, you have all kinds of Nazarenes, sure. the Free Methodists, there's lots of them. Um, okay, so uh, this is something that 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 is unique with the UMC in that it actually is an international denomination in of itself. Mm -hmm. There are more members outside the U.S., especially now, especially after the disaffiliations. Um, there are more members in Africa than there are members in the United States. So what does this mean moving forward? Well, it could be a couple of things. One, the General Conference passed something called the Regionalization Plan, which uh, is an attempt to essentially create different national regions where the discipline will have different uh, moral standards. They'll have a core doctrine, doctrinal um, statement, but everything else is pretty much up for uh, contextual reasoning, as they describe it. If that moves forward, which is not guaranteed, um, then you could see various regions continue to be conservative, um, but the U.S. progressive. My, my instinct is that Africa is going to reject both regionalization and staying connected to the liberalized American church. Um, not all of them, but I think a, a large portion of them will probably either become independent or join the emerging global Methodist Church. We talked a little bit about disaffiliation and the ability uh, over the last couple of years to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. And, so, and I use the word diocese. What do you guys use for Methodism? When you, you it's a conference. It's an annual conference. conference. Okay, conference. So in your yeah. conferences, it, there, there was different um, uh, bars set by different bishops of how to disaffiliate. Some of it was yeah. easy. Hey, sign this paper. You're out of here. Um, yeah. uh, I currently live in Florida. There's a church down the uh, the street from me that just signed the paper. It was an easy disaffiliation uh, with the bishop there. Other places in the country, there was financial uh, uh, walls to climb to, to disaffiliate. Uh, explain yeah. how that worked. So the, the loophole that was created in 2019, not loophole, the disaffiliation process that was created in 2019 said that a local church had to vote by a two-thirds majority and to pay the equivalent of two years of what they're called apportionments in the UMC, there would be assessments in the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the baseline. Um, two thirds vote, two years of assessment. Well, so in some places, yeah, every, like you said, it, in Florida, initially it wasn't that way. There were lawsuits, unfortunately, in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, places like North Carolina, places in Texas, Kentucky, um, th they did this with integrity. They just followed the book. And if a church voted to get out, the vast majority of them were simply allowed to. But what happened is that there were some bishops um, who decided that they weren't, they didn't want to allow these disaffiliations to take place. And so they put, as you were noting, a additional hoops to jump through 
For example, I'm, I'm in my office in Washington. This is the Baltimore Washington Conference of the, of the UMC. And this particular conference said you have to pay up to half the value of the property to get out. So in that case, sometimes that's millions and millions of dollars. Uh, and some of these churches just couldn't do it. And so, you know, New Jersey, same problem. Um, and it, it's weird. There were some churches um, where conferences tried to stop just those particular churches. Um, there were Normally these were churches uh, of substantial means that might have had endowments. <laughs> um, sorry, to bring money into this, right? <laughs> you do, you got to bring money into it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there was some of that as well. Uh, and it's and it was it was kind of sad to see that that kind of thing taking place, um, but it for the most part, and I'd say they learned by watching what Anglicanism did fifteen years ago. Sure. Um, for the most part, it was a, a, a very um, well. I, I hesitate to say a reasonable process. It was better than what we've seen in the past. The problem is with any church divide, it's a divorce, and there's emotions that come out of the woodwork. I I can I can't tell you how many people have just exploded about these issues simply when a conversation began, because it brings up some deep seated emotions that that I just had no idea were there with certain people. Um, particularly, and this I found this interesting, a number of the retired clergy on social media were, were very outspoken against anyone who wanted to leave. And I, I, I think maybe, well, you know, they'd given 40 years of their life and their service to that church and their work, you know, was, they saw their work disappearing before their eyes perhaps, but it, it's an interesting process. The whole thing and any church split is, is a bit messy. This was a bit better though. Well, hold on. I mean, let's just go back to John Wesley. He yeah. did his work within the church. He did yes. not want to leave. He did not want to create a different church. He thought the best work he could do uh, as a minister of the gospel and in his pursuit of holiness and uh, was to stay within the church. Right. Okay. In, in the so, of England, yeah. yeah. I mean, not everything, not everything he did corresponded to his words. In oh, that regard. come on. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, uh, you know, for the... In a nutshell, he created a he created a structure, a formation within the Church of England that started to gain its own ethos and its own legs after he died. That's for yeah. sure. But you're right; he never intended for it to leave. He wanted it to be a, a renewal movement. Um, now, over here on the American side, it was a little different, given the war. Um, and he did help establish the Methodist Episcopal Church in 1784. Correct. Uh, so, all right. So. A lot of people say, how does this happen to a church? A church has core doctrines and beliefs, and all you got to do is, is stick with those, and your church should stay on a, a good course and continue to grow and help people and show them the salt and the light uh, with which God wants them to see. However, in my short years, 15 years as a journalist, I noticed that the church that does not have accountability in its higher echelon loses right away uh yeah. you call your 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 bylaws the disciplines what happened when when did the church decide that they wanted to stop uh holding bishops and clergy accountable yeah um it's a really complicated thing i think you have to go back to the i mean methodism at the beginning of the 20th century methodism uh, what would become United Methodism was the largest Protestant mm -hmm. group in the country, and it was quite broad. In um, you know, they, they had lots of progressives, they had lots of evangelicals, um, and of course, over the years throughout the 20th century, what you see with Methodism is 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 reun the reunification of institutional Methodism, the bringing together of of essentially four churches by its 1968 to create the United Methodist Church. The unity is a good thing, obviously, but what they did is they brought together disparate groups under a larger umbrella who, even at that time, didn't have shared values. You still had, you know, the conservative Southern Bible Belt, you had Northern progressives, you had 
Midwestern, you know, good people, you know, just clean living and all the rest of it. But you had also Protestant liberalism, you had fundamentalism, you had all those things kind of within the UMC. And they tried to, to hold it together through a doctrine of pluralism. Um, they quickly realized that pluralism wasn't a doctrine at all. It was a mess. And so you, you saw a number of things start. A renewed interest in Wesley was one of them. A renewed interest in biblical formation and Bible study coming out of the, the 80s and 90s. Um, the thing is, though, the, the seminaries continued, many of them, and uh, continued and became more and more progressive. And so what you had was um, a difference between the clergy who were being produced and the standards, the historic standards of the church. Um, and that dissonance created a, cl a climate, I think, where the leaders of the denomination didn't share the denomination's values. And of course, it's the leaders who are supposed to enforce the discipline. Um, and, but if you don't actually agree with the discipline, despite going before God and the conference and your mother and everybody else when you're ordained and saying that you do, um, <laughs> then, then, then there's this massive tension here. Um, and in fact, I think that the tension of integrity or the lack thereof was one of the biggest challenges for, for, for uh, United Methodists. Um, but, but it wasn't just over sexuality. I mean, in, in the 1960s, only half of, of Methodist clergy believed in the virgin birth, for example. Um, you know, there's been studies of this kind of thing. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect uh, way to join the Episcopal Church, but go on. <laughs> well, it's interesting. If you look at the Episcopal Church um, statistics at that at that time, there's a yeah. whole series of of, uh, of uh, studies of the mainline churches and the beliefs of the clergy at that time the episcopalians were much more conservative um but anyway <laughs> what, what you find within methodism now um is that there's a sense in which enforcing the, the rules would be seen as a form of of harm and not being nice is the cardinal sin of any methodist and so that kind of undermines things um the, la the lack of uh, traditional formation in the seminaries, the lack of uh, a desire to live into the discipline, a lack of desire to even believe in the discipline, led to all kinds of uh, structural problems. And I think the other thing that most people might not realize is that, that the United Methodist Church, as it evolved, was one of the most distinctly hierarchical structures in all of American Christianity. You know, it, it's not like in the Episcopal Church. People have asked me, they said, how can conservatives be in the Episcopal Church? I said, well, you know, there are Episcopal parishes where conservatives have gathered. Sure. And they hear the gospel Sunday after Sunday um, because the, the parish has, you know, it can determine a number of things, including where the clergy might be. You have no such, no, nothing like that in, in the United Methodist Church. The clergy are appointed. Um if they're in good standing, there's no reason why you can turn them away. So if your your pastor gets up on Sun on Easter Sunday and says that the resurrection was a nice idea, um, you know you can't get rid of them. You have no choice in it. So there's you, all these things come to bear on that question, Kevin. It's it's kind of a mess in the making. And in fact, I I hate to put it this way, but everybody talks about in the, the UMC dividing over sex when really it was polity that killed them. Yeah. Um, but polity is not sexy, so it's not. But we sit in this this you know place where we have to look back and you know what happened, you know, and can we really forensically you know tell ourselves that um, it could have it, we could have stopped it at this point? Is there any point in the last fifteen years we could stop the trajectory of uh, United Methodism breaking apart? I, I believe so. Um... This is a difficult question, but where do you believe well, this could happen? It is, and it isn't. I think, I think the UMC actually died in 2012. There were attempts to reform aspects of the structure, mm -hmm. to get rid of things like guaranteed appointment. Uh, what that means, by the way, is if you're a member of the clergy in good standing, um, you are guaranteed tenure. employment. Yeah. It's complete and utter tenure from a very early age. Yeah. Um, 
they tried to get rid of that, but something called the, Ju the Judicial Council, I told you it was hierarchical, it, this is the Supreme Court of the UMC, um, essentially said no to all the reforms that the General Conference passed in 2012. It was amazing because they came down on the, on the last day of General Conference and just said no. Mm -hmm. So this is a small group of people who told the thousand delegates there who've been trying to reform the church, no. What they did in 2012 was they baked in the dysfunction of the UMC. So, so the, the disaffiliation, by the way, is not necessarily a rejection of the bonds of friendship or affection that people had. It was an absolute, um, it was the breaking point where people were simply fed up with a system that no longer worked. Um, and, and it's a sad situation because so many people felt caught up in it and stuck in it. Uh, so, it so I'd go back to 2012. Now, the reason I say that is I think the only way the UMC could have possibly held together is if they had taken up something of the, the spirit of mutual flourishing you see in the Church of England, where, um, and I know this C of E is not always popular with you, Kevin. What? But, um, <laughs> I heard you yeah, talk. No, no, no <laughs> mutual flourishing is, I don't think it's worked, but continue on. Well, you know. But, you know, mutual flourishing, the concept of mutual flourishing, right, yeah. is that people with different theological perspectives can function with integrity and flourish within protected structures of the Church of England. Uh, for you know, for it, secondary issues, non-salvation issues. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the main one that, that they did this over was women's ordination. Correct. So, um, had the UMC adopted some form of mutual flourishing whereby evangelicals could um, maintain their ministry long term. And I'm not just talking about the clergy, I'm talking about the parishes. You know, there, I'm, there, there was a strong evangelical United Methodist Church just about, about 30 minutes from where I'm sitting that ran, you know, 500 people on a Sunday morning for decades, it's a great witness in the community. And then the conference decided to appoint a, a, a number of progressive pastors to that church. And the thing went from 500 to 20. So you see things like that happen and you say, look, there's no possibility of maintaining a witness here. Uh, and that's just one example. I can give you thousands of them. Had the UMC done that, mutual flourishing is just the term I'm gonna stick with. I think they could have held it together in some form. The problem though, is to even discuss mutual flourishing, you have to trust one another. And when people are breaking the canons of the church, the discipline over and over and over again, no repercussions, no integrity, then trust is out the window. So it it really it really just kind of melted. It's a sad, sad story. It, it is a sad story because if I sat here and collected all the weird horrible quotes that have come from UMC clergy over the last 20 years or the Episcopal Church clergy over the last 30 years. Uh, there's just no competition. I mean, we could just post them and say, oh, look at that crazy person. Well, that crazy person got to stay in the church, got to lead a church, and there was just no discipline for them. And, you know, in the Episcopal Church, we lost it because we had uh, bishops who would not hold other bishops accountable. Here, you've lost it because you have no ability to take out a bad clergy person. That or even just maintain that ministry. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't, you know, it wasn't a designated evangelical church. Uh, and, the, and the thing is, evangelicals, evangelicals and the pews are more than happy to get up and leave if they... <laughs> If they don't hear the gospel, yeah, they've been prone to do that um, for three hundred years. Thank God. But and 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 the thing is, I mean, with that with that itinerant system, um, there are no protections now for the conservatives who remain in the UMC. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that because, see, here is the thing: the leadership of the UMC has been talking about the big tent for the last year or two. Draw the circle. And well, it's, but it's but it's even a big tent where they say we want traditionalists here. Hmm. And the thing is, Kevin, I, I I believe them. I do. I think that most of the leaders in the UMC who, who are progressives 
they actually want traditionalists in the UMC. The, the thing is, um, you can't base a long-term ministry on the current intentions of the person who simply happens to be in office right now. There are no protections when the next person comes in. And, you know, if, if, if they see this as a justice issue and you are on the unjust side of things, that toleration, uh, you know, it, it's just, there's no guarantees. Yeah. There's just no guarantees. Well, that's what the Church of England discovered with mutual flourishing. It was a great concept initially, but at, at a certain point, uh, most recently in the, the appointment of uh, trying to get some conservative bishops installed, uh, mutual flourishing failed. Uh, yeah, long they're term. still trying. They're long still term. trying. I'm, yeah, they're I'm, trying. I'm glad they're still trying. Mm-hmm. And, and and all my Anglo Catholic friends in England are glad they're trying it too. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, church destroyed by piety, that's that's the way Satan uh, envisioned it. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a lot of paradoxes and ironies in the chants that I hear coming from the progressives in the church. They want to be inclusive with a larger circle. They want to decolonize the church. They want to um, uh, do no harm. Well, this is harm. You're teaching evil. You're adopting evil. You're practicing evil, and that does tremendous harm in a church, uh, if not destroy a church from within. Uh, what do you see as the ironies going on right now? The ironies of this split. I mean, I think I think I think the ironies um, include the fact that people probably there were a lot of people of goodwill who could have sat down if they were allowed to and worked things out in a way that would have allowed, allowed everyone to have integrity. Um, but there just wasn't the, the possibility of it. Um, so when good people, regardless of whether they're progressive or conservative, when good people can't even sit down in a church setting and, and, and discuss things together, I mean, that's not an irony. That's, that's horrible. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's a nightmare. So, I think the other irony is that for many within Methodism, mainstream Methodism, you know, Methodism was only founded. I think God only raised up the Methodists to promote scriptural holiness. I think that's the only reason that Methodists exist. And now we have a number of, of people, um, the core of, of a denomination, essentially, just arguing for a, a kind of a boring niceness that doesn't call anyone to holiness. And, um, I, you know, it, it, even the world isn't interested in that, <laughs> you know, let alone Christians. And so I, I worry about what I call mushy mainline Methodism. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful message that they have. That the, the depths of the Christian faith are there. But it's just going along with this contemporary cultural niceness, and um, it doesn't lead anyone to anything of substance. I want to talk a little bit about the silence of other denominations in this, too. Mm. Um, boom. The, the church is split in half uh, over sexuality, uh, identity politics, uh, whatever reason, polity. But I didn't hear anything from the Roman Catholic Church saying this is horrible. The Lutherans put out no statement. Uh, no denomination has put out a statement saying that this is terrible. How, you know, how could they let this happen? Uh, this this little explosion in United Methodism uh, was kind of the the explosion not heard around the world. Nobody's listening. Nobody cares anymore. Uh, it, is this strange to you that you know there is no? Uh, you know, uniformity response in in Christendom to this. You know, that is interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't, I had not noticed that. Um, I had a number of, of Catholics reach out to me and say how sad they were to hear of this, uh, of the decisions of the General Conference. Mm-hmm. Um, before that, I had Catholics reaching out because they were sad to hear of the 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 division because, you know, baked into Catholic identity is unity. So. Um, but you're right. There haven't been denominational responses to this. I don't know. Yeah. Some people, I don't, it's it's kind of, 
I go back to the analogy of a divorce, though. This is all part of the Methodist divorce. And um, commenting on somebody else's divorce isn't isn't very tactful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not going to pick sides because somebody's going to have a cookout next week and I want to be invited. Absolutely. There you go. Yeah. That's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about global uh, Anglicanism, global Methodism. Uh, the Af Africans uh, used to have some type of voice within United Methodism. And that, that has slowly been wind whittled away um, until recently I was re reaching, reading about all these uh, Africans who wanted to come over for your convention and weren't able to because they couldn't get visas. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, boy, welcome to Anglicanism, you know? Yeah, it's 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 really a, a sad situation. So, um, I mean, the, the vast majority of United Methodists today live in Africa, mm -hmm. and yet their voice at General Conference was um, it should have been 25 percent of the of the delegates, which was still not representative. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the way that it's structured is distinctly um, problematic. Um, the, um, the, 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 the small liberal conferences out, out West, um, have much more representation than these massive, um, African conferences with, with millions of people in them. Anyway, the, at least, at least from what I understand, I think it was about half of the African delegates were not able to get visas. Um, just a huge amount, 80 delegates that I heard of. We're not able to get uh, visas, and part of that is simply because they didn't receive the invitations necessary in time um, from the Americans running the conference in Charlotte um, to take to their embassies and and to go through the visa process. Um, it, it's just it's really sad. I know I also heard there were some translation issues um, of delegates not exactly knowing what was being voted on at that time. So there's another issue right there, but. It, it'll be interesting to see what Africa does, to be honest, Kevin. It's, um, they don't have the patience, from my experience, is that they're, they're impatient with Western progressive yes, ideology. Are. And uh, you see that in Anglicanism, too. I mean, you know, look at GAFCON and some of these other. Same, there's a, that same kind of fervent impatience <laughs> with Western progressives. Um, and so we'll see what's happening. There's something called the Africa Initiative that's led by, by a friend of mine. His name is Jerry Kula, uh, and he's the dean of Theological College in Liberia. And, um, and it, it, it's amazing. He comes up to my shoulder, but he's, he's a force to reckon with, I'll tell you what. Um, filled with the spirit, absolutely. But um, he's the leader of the Africa Initiative, and, and I'm, I'm so glad that he's a voice of reason for uh, African United Methodists, because the other problem is the, the, the African United Methodist bishops are primarily institutionalists trying to hold on to connections to the American church. Uh, for whatever reason, I, 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 for the life of me, I don't know why. Um, but there has to be something there. I do know that there's quite a bit of financial subsidy involved. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's that. I mean, a number of uh, some in, in Africa have already joined the, the Global Methodist Church. Uh, and for your viewers, the Global Methodist Church is the new evangelical Methodist denomination that's come out of all this. Um, it has at present about uh, 4,500 churches in the U.S. Nice. And, yeah. Wow. And the last, the last statistic I saw was 850 thousand members at present mm -hmm. um i think it'll go over a million uh it's in the next year so it's it really quite something actually how the global methodists have have pulled together and and uh put up put up annual conferences and transitional conferences and all the rest of it and ordained hundreds and hundreds of new pastors in the last year it's been really something to watch okay so some people stayed in the united methodist church uh, <laughs> they're probably thinking right now too long. What does the church do now that wants to leave the United Methodist Church? Is there uh, disaffiliations over that little grace period that was set up uh, no longer exists? Uh, what do you do? Well, you know, it depends on your conference. Um, 
there are other ways to get out. They might not be as simple and straightforward, but I do know that in South Carolina and in West Virginia, they're continuing the disaffiliation process. They're, they have extended it. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I think it's, it's in a week or two, there's gonna be a vote in South Carolina and a couple hundred churches are probably leaving South Carolina. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's still possible. Now, for other areas of the country, I don't know. Um, there, there's ongoing lawsuits in Maryland that I know of. Um, I imagine what we'll see is less shut. How do I put this? A less movement of parishes and more movement of people. Um, I think that's what we're going to see in the next uh, the next couple of years, as we'll we'll see. I think because of the decisions at General Conference in the UMC uh, in the last couple of weeks, you probably see. I, my estimate is probably about four hundred thousand or so leave the UMC just voluntarily. Um, now, where they end up, I don't know. Yeah. And see, that's that's one of the issues I have with this whole thing, is that I think what's what's ending up happening. Or what's but there's a potential to happen is a weakening of the Wesleyan movement in this country, as people just go everywhere, and I think that Wesleyanism has something to offer the larger church. Now you're saying that go anywhere would some of these people join Anglicanism or? Well, uh, they have. Yes, a number of them have. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm not too worried about that. I'm worried about the kind of independent um, churches that essentially are Baptist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, without putting it on the door. Yeah. Um, the Wesleys were Anglicans, so if the Wesleyans go into an Anglican context, <laughs> it's okay. It's still it's safe. Fine. So let's back ourselves out of this a little bit. And um, obviously, everybody has a way forward. And that way forward mm -hmm. for Anglicanism is to form a Gafcon, or for the Roman Catholic Church is to uh, complain about the Pope. Uh, there's always a way forward. What's the way forward now for Methodism? Is this just it, the divide and hope that uh, this doesn't happen again to the Orthodox traditional global Methodists? Or, you know, there there is there's good that comes out of this kind of realignment. Mm -hmm. um, I think you've seen in Anglicanism too. There's a renewed interest in the tradition. There's a discovery of the riches of the tradition that that you know, just right underneath the, the topsoil for so many years. And, and people are finding that and they're discovering that. I mean, and that's, that's essentially my job is to show the Wesleyans the riches of their own heritage. Um, that's what I do for a living now. And um, together with you know, a few hundred other scholars trying to, to point out the beauty of that, of that tradition. And so I'm hopeful. I really am hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful for the United Methodists, that they can move forward without the acrimony that has marked that church for 50 years. There's something to say about that. Yes, yes. Um, I'm hopeful for the global Methodists that, that there's this renewed interest in the transforming power of the Holy Spirit that marked early Methodism. These people are um, uh, they're clamoring for revival, to use kind of <laughs> Wesleyan language there. Um, and it's and it's really something beautiful. They're rediscovering the scriptures. They're rediscovering um, not just Wesley. If if you focus on Wesley, you you miss the point. Wesley's pointing at Jesus the whole time. Um, so staring at him is stupid, <laughs> you know. And so they're discovering that he's pointing them with everything he has mm -hmm. to a transformed life, one that looks like Jesus Christ. And one that knows Christ and 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 is filled with the Spirit, and I mean that that's a beautiful vision. And in fact, if if the global Methodists are able to embrace that, um, it's good for the American Church. Um, and and of course, I think global method. I mean, the name the name is intentionally global. By the way, it's not just an American Church. In fact, the first conference to join, I think, was. Um, um, I think it, was it was either Romania or Hungary. That's that somebody's going to correct me on that one. Um, but there are opportunities, I think, for worldwide Methodism as well, um, that the global Methodists will point again to the, that, that power that marked the early Methodist movement. And so I'm hopeful that for a way forward uh, in that regard. Okay, so once the ACNA formed 
and GAFCON had formed, there was a, a period of time that we had to find out well, what's safe. Where are the safe places? Where are the safe seminaries to send our students? Where are the safe places to, uh, you know, grow the church? Where can we start planting churches? I don't think you guys have to worry about planting churches. Um, but what is safe? So I'm going to ask you, wh where's a safe seminary to send uh, prospective uh, uh, seminarians in Methodism now? Well, I can give you a couple of them. Um, I mean, the largest one would be Asbury Theological Seminary. Sure. Yeah. It's been a stalwart um, for over 100 years now. Um, United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. It's it's still United Methodist, but it's solid. Mm -hmm. um, they've got um, some amazing faculty at United. Um, Wesley Biblical Seminary, Jackson, Mississippi. Um, wonderful holiness. Um, I mean, these are the salt of the earth people at Wesley Biblical, and they're reaching all kinds of people that some of the, you know, the the R1 university types never would. Um, um, Wesley House at Baylor at Truett wonderful, wonderful new program um, Methodist Studies at um, Beast and Divinity at Samford University in Birmingham Alabama, wonderful so I mean there, there, there are plenty of places to go um, there's no lack of theological education uh, for the Wesleyan world and I should note of course that Asbury has a number of extension campuses so it's not just in kentucky <laughs> no there there you can definitely do uh wesleyan studies in, in many different places because of the asbury extensions so yeah. that's good but in okay terms of like all of those faculties i described all of them are are sound mm -hmm. you know these are not this is not um a pluralist project this isn't you know none of these function i, I know that baylor functions within a university so does I mean, I know Baylor is a university and so is yes, Sam. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we're not talking about the kind of university education where you're simply there to learn about religion or to learn various and sundry perspectives on this, 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 and this. Um, these are solid programs to shape and form theological leadership for the church. And I think that that makes a big difference. All right. Now for the surprise. Oh. You are no longer... A Methodist? No, not officially. Let's let's make <laughs> let's 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 let the world know uh, what Dr. Ryan Danker has become. <laughs> well, I was, <laughs> I was given firmly the Episcopal Church in 2011. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you you have recently uh, reaffiliated yourself with the Episcopal Church, then. I mean, I'm a member of St. Paul's K Street here in Washington, D.C. Yeah. I've gone there for years. Um, I just I just said something about it on, on social <laughs> media the other day, which I uh, quickly took down because I didn't like all that. <laughs> it's funny. I, even if I was no longer attached institutionally to a Methodist body, mm -hmm. I don't want to burn any bridges with sure. anybody. Yeah. That's not the point. And I didn't, I didn't leave anything out of acrimony. I found a home where Christ is proclaimed in a city where I just moved and where my friends were. <laughs> and it was happened to be, you know, wonderfully high Anglo-Catholic parish. Um, and so, uh, and the thing is with my work as director of the John Wesley Institute, I work with Methodists primarily um, of all stripes and uh, now, if you ask me if I'm a Wesleyan, yes, through and through. I still believe in Christian perfection, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Holy, 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 which is there great. You go. I mean, uh, throughout the history of the church, there's been many times it had to be reformed. And thank God for John Wesley. Thank God yeah. for, um, you know, these great Martin Luther through, throughout history. Yeah, I, I can pick them, you know, five off the top of my, my head here. And we need it again now. A, you know, in in the yeah. the Christian Church, we have lost our unity. We've lost our focus. We've lost our ecumenicalism. Oh, big word, sorry. You know, we've lost our ability to work together and to seek out what's best for each other. And we, as a church, have to rediscover that. And I know uh, certainly in the ACNA they have uh, uh, groups of people working towards that. But it's hard when every time you reach out to somebody, they start splitting. You know, yeah. and, and you're it, you find yourself in the in the middle of somebody else's mess, and you know 
that that's a hard place to be. But hey, welcome back to the Episcopal Church, uh, Ryan, and uh, uh, hope to have you more on as as there's going to be further developments in this story. You know, obviously, Anglican TV has been covering the Anglican collision for uh, 15 years. There's no such thing yet as a Methodist unscripted, so we'll have you back uh, as often as there's news. And I want to thank you so much for your time, Ryan. No, it's been great to be with you, Kevin. I'm Kevin Coulson. I've been with Dr. Ryan Danker on episode 856 of Anglican Unscripted.